Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our session today. We're all, about, we're all divas now, how to reach high maintenance consumers with your brand story. So I'm Julie Rezek. I'm the managing director of the Seattle Wonderman Network. We're 350 people strong here in Seattle. And I'm excited to be here today with all of you to host this session, but also to attend many others and learn from some of you today as well. I've got a great set of panelists here that I'll introduce. First and foremost, Kelby Johnson. He's the Senior Emerging Media Strategist, Seattle Wonderman Network. Kelby is a creative marketing and communication strategist with expertise and experience in social media marketing, corporate communications, perception management, product marketing, relationship marketing, conversational marketing, and influencer relations. He does a lot. He, <laughs> he joined Wonderman after 16 years of representing brands on both the agency and client sides of the marketing world. His lens of the world is converged media and integrated RM strategies. He is a customer first thinker and has helped multinational brands including Microsoft, Alcatel, Sun, Accenture, and Clarisonic envision new ways of enhancing the customer experience. So next up is Esther Lim, and Esther Lim is a Vice President of Group Accounts at Story Worldwide and a respective digital marketing leader, transmedia producer, social media strategist, and game analyst. She has over 15 years of combined interactive agency and consulting experience, creating digital, social media, and transmedia storytelling programs for Fortune 500 brands looking to create original content narratives. Her client list includes ABC, NBC, Disney, Stars, Microsoft, Cisco, Lexus, Holland America, Epica Wines, and Puma. And last but not least, Jessica Michaels. I've also had the pleasure of working with Jessica in the past. Jessica is the founder and lead strategist at Bread and Butter Digital, which is a strategic branding collective with a focus on social and emerging media. Jessica launched Bread and Butter in 2011 after 10 years in media and design leadership roles. She has led digital marketing strategy and product innovation at many of the world's leading brands and agencies, such as WPP's Group M, Wonderman, Microsoft, Xbox, Sony, PlayStation, and the list goes on. So we're hoping to have a fun panel here today and keep you all engaged. And once we get through a few quick, short presentations, at any time, if anyone wants to ask a question, please walk up to the mic in the middle, and we'll definitely make sure that you're part of that conversation and have a chance to ask questions. But first and foremost, I'm gonna kick off a few slides here. And the reality is, folks, we're all divas now. And frankly, I'm a self-confessed diva. And I expect, for example, that Amazon knows I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old at home and that they like Transformers. And that when I bought my neighbor's new pet or new dog um, a gift, I don't need to see pet supplies popping up and being cross-sold to me on a constant basis because I actually don't have a pet at home. And frankly, just two weeks ago, when I bought the shoes I'm wearing here today, I did my usual, usual research. I went to Nordstrom, Zappos, and a few other places. And I got the you know, typical retargeting thing happening to me. But four days after I bought my shoes, one day and for four days straight, I was bombarded with black stilettos. I mean, there was like banners on the left side, on the top, down the back. And I was like, oh my God, what is going on here? And it's because, you know, we're in this industry and we know what is actually happening. I thought, wow, guys, I bought these shoes four days ago and you guys are completely failing right now. So I'm sure you all can relate. So it should come as no surprise that we're living in an age of high maintenance consumers. The divas have taken over and they are driving conversations that brands once owned. I was recently in Chicago and was traveling with a colleague of mine who actually might be in the audience, so I'm not sure he'll like me telling everyone this, but you learn a lot from people when you're traveling with them. And one thing I discovered about him is that he does everything by Yelp. He does not do anything unless Yelp tells him it's okay to do that. And some of you might find that to be limiting, but the reality is, is he chooses to make every decision that he, you know, that he does based on consumer comments and opinions. So for brands and marketers, this makes meeting these high expectations even more difficult. Transparency and relevancy are no longer enough, and consumers are demanding value. But how do you drive value in a meaningful way? We're here to talk about how to reach high maintenance consumers with your brand story, how to create a compelling, user-friendly, action-oriented, and value-centric story across media types. But beyond being consumer divas, there are also really big obstacles in the way. For example, big data is no longer a big secret. 
anyone, whether you're a marketer or not, can open Business Week and know that the conversation is about big data. In fact, there are 112 million blog posts that discuss big data. Wikipedia gets 70,000 searches for big data each month. And even more telling is that in 2010, there were zero job searches that came up for data scientists. In, by the end of 2012, there were over 9,000 available positions. So why does this matter? Well, consumers know that the data exists and they expect us as marketers to use it. And when we don't, they notice. And if finding ways to use big data wasn't big enough, the volume of content is overwhelming. People are creating new behaviors. Every screen has different interactions. And that fragmentation of every screen makes a cohesive customer experience even more challenging. And to think that every day, every minute of the day, sorry, this is the activity that is happening. Pretty outstanding, pretty challenging. But enough about me and my little setup here. I'm going to actually pass it to Kelby so he can talk about how to reach high maintenance consumers with your brand story. Thank you, Julie. Hello, everybody. Um, just one thing to kick off uh, before we get into frameworks and all the other kind of good stuff about how to create experiences. Something that I think we marketers often overlook is the fact that we are lifelong learners. If we're not, we should be. Learning comes with experiment experimentation. And all of those folks here that are operating in social media or mobile or whatever, you know the value of experimenting. It, it, it tells you stories. It helps you learn. And so, like Albert said, you know, once you stop learning, you start dying. And I think that's just a, a, a key kind of level set that I, I forget it sometimes. And so I assume not everybody in this room is perfect. Um, you, nobody has it all figured out. And if they are, they're snake oil salesmen. We all know that. We went through that phase with social. I'm a social media guru. That great little video that was about, that was uh, the animated video, that was really cool, but they don't really exist. So um, we need to just think about, you know, how are we learning on an ongoing basis? And, you know, when, when we're thinking about what we're learning and what we're doing as marketers, we are in the experience business. I mean, that's kind of what we do or should be doing. And so we need to think about how we're using these learnings, all this always on learning through listening, through word of mouth, through connecting at places like this to actually figure out how to uh, create more memorable experiences. And as I said, I don't have it all figured out, but um, this is a framework that I hope will help some of you uh, understand how and think about, think differently about how you actually build memorable experiences. So as Julie was saying, Yelp and others, you know, if you think about the customer ecosystem, our ecosystem, everybody in this room, it's, it's, it's distracted. It's, our attentions are at a, a major deficit because we're listening to the social conversations. We're doing reviews. We're reading Tumblr blogs. We're looking at GIFs, yada, yada, yada. And then there's email. And then there's music. So if you think about that ecosystem, it's very complex, very noisy. How do you navigate it? How do you actually use it and actually build memorable experiences for the, the brands as agencies and your brand? How do you build those for customers? So to start off with, you know, really thinking about the, the, the notion of understanding. Understand who you're talking to. You know, if you talk to clients, if you're an agency, oh, I know who my IT pros are. I know who my, my decision makers are. Do you really? What are their passions? What do they like outside of your brand? What are their interests? Do they like soccer? Are they into hockey? You know, what do they, what do, they do? What are their motivations for action? And so really kind of going deep and understanding, you know, what, what the consumers you're trying to reach, who they really are and what they really do. And let's be clear, I mean, experience creation is an art. It's not, it's not simple, it's pretty hard work. But it all starts with understanding. Um, then I think you really need to figure out how you integrate the experience across channels, across media, across platforms. You know, our, our worlds, not only from the noise level, but the technology level are getting more and more complex and more and more noisy. And so figuring out how you integrate your experiences across touch points is a, another important factor to consider. Jeremiah Ouyang, some of you guys may know him. He put out a blog in 2010, I think it was, and he talked about the social evolution of business. And you know, it's like, that, at that time it was like, it's tied, you have a Facebook page. But by the end of, when you really reached social integration in business, the only thing that changes for your consumers is the URL. Everything else is seamless. And I mean, that's, that's kind of a lofty goal. I think we're still way off from that. But that kind of notion of integrating across channels and devices is really important. 
And then, as we all know, the creative types in the house here, it's, it, the magic really happens when you are uh, c building compelling creative and interactive assets that drive action, that drive people to want to interact with you, that drive people to want to share. And so, you know, that notion of having a really good creative team and really having that lens and understanding what drives action, that's critical when you start to build. And then, as we all know, it's all about optimization. What's the ROI? Well, how are we going to measure this? Blah, 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 blah. It's, those are all interesting. Um, but listening really helps you crystallize, you know, what are those trends? What are those memes? What are those stories that can actually help you truly get to an ROI that works for your brand or your customers? And this, I think, is a, a, secular, a circular pattern here because once you figure out how to optimize what's working for the customers you're trying to reach, and again, there's probably different segments, then your understanding lens shifts a little bit. And so it's just kind of, I hope this framework, again, to some of you, is probably super basic, but um, it's a way to kind of capture kind of what you need to do when you're, when you're thinking about building experiences. And at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do through these experiences is build one-to-one -one connections, lasting connections, connections that people want to actually come back to your agency, your brand, and actually talk to you and interact with you and, and talk about you in good ways, hopefully. Um, and I think some of the magic there, it comes with storytelling. And this is where I'll hand it over to Esther to give a kind of a sense of how she perceives storytelling, the challenges and opportunities they're in. Great. Thanks a lot, Cal uh, Calby. Um, so I'm going to riff off of a couple of points that you brought up that will sort of frame what I'd like to talk about in terms of storytelling across platforms. Um, creating memorable experiences to build lasting relationships. So I want to start out with a Kevin Spacey quote. Um, has anyone seen the video that was going around with Kevin Spacey and the, the speech that he gave in Glasgow to the International Film Festival? Raise hands. Okay, a few. So this is worthwhile for all marketers, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is, is because I think what he says in this quote is sort of the golden grail that we all try to achieve as brands. And according to the quote, he says, audiences want stories. They're dying for them. They're rooting for us to give, us, give them the right thing. And they will talk about it, binge on it, carry it with them on the bus and to the hairdresser, force it on their friends, tweet, blog, Facebook, make fan pages, silly gifs, and God knows what else. Engage with it with a passion and an intimacy that a blockbuster movie could only dream of. And we all, have, all we have to do is give it to them. And now that's really profound for me because it isn't just about entertainment he's talking about. I think as brands move more into content marketing and utilizing content as a way to connect with their, their audience and their customers, they're seeking to get that fanatic, rabid fan base that entertainment and music has enjoyed for quite a long time. And I think a lot of that has to do with what makes up a good storytelling platform. So I see it as sort of four areas, having great characters, authentic storytelling, audience knowledge, and customized journeys. So we talk a little bit, we have a little overlap in what Kel Kelby was saying in his, his last slide, but it's, it's relevant. So let's talk about great characters for a minute. People develop relationships with people, not abstracts, not things. So when we think about our brand, I think we still tend to think about it in a very abstract form. And if we want to create narratives that are going to resonate with people and, re and make it so that we can relate to them, we have to come down to a human level. So I say make your brand personable. So we all know who the character on the left is, right? I mean, sometimes I don't remember the brand, but I do remember her, and I know it's insurance. So good job, well done, right? Flow is a nice embodiment of the progressive brand. The one on the right is a lot of fun, too. I kept it here even though it's an older image because it talks about an abstract product, such as you know, the search engines and the browsers, right? And it contextualizes what their personality or brand attributes are. So you've got Firefox, who's the little scrappy guy always playing on the edge, trying to do things outside of the norm. And then you've got the big, big bully in the, the arena. Sorry. Sorry, uh, Google. <laughs> and then poor Microsoft, even though this is a little dated and they've made some advancements, traditionally they've been known to be a little bit slower, not innovating as well, and, you know, we're <laughs> eating glue in the corner. But as you can see, it kind of brings the brand down to this level where you can, from an emotional standpoint, really connect and start to go, yeah, I can identify with that person. I can identify with the stories that surround them. Um, identifying authentic storytelling areas. So what does this mean? What I find when we're creating narrative for brands is that sometimes brands are so aspirational about what they want their audiences to think about them and feel about them that they start to put content out there that they think 
um, will make them seem cooler to their audience's eyes. Yes, it might be of interest to the audience, but it doesn't align from where they're coming from. It doesn't align with the ethos or the attributes or the pillars that they stand on. And what I mean by that is, what are the actions that that brand has taken in the past that would say, yeah, that makes sense, right? I can see them doing that. I'll give you an example, and I know this could be a tricky one, but Starbucks, and you recently heard about them doing the um, survey to stop the government shutdown, right? When I read that, it was not surprising for me, given that I understand that the ethos of the brand starts out at community level, grassroots, doing good. And they've done a lot of actions over the years with their brands that support this context. So to see them come out with something like that, it's not a leap for me to say, oh, that doesn't seem at all like what I would see. Starbucks doing. I'll give you another example. Driving in this morning, McDonald's had a sign out that said pumpkin spice latte tastes like autumn. To me, that was dissonance, right? I see that as being owned by Starbucks. That's authentic. That's ownable content. From McDonald's, not so much. Feels kind of like a copycat move. So again, be true to yourself and you'll ring true to the world. That's true for us as human beings as we relate to one another. It's also true for brands when we want to seek to build connections and trust. Don't be everything to everyone. So um, this speaks for our, the, itself in many ways because our mom always said to us, or our parents always said that you can't be everything to everyone, and this is true for brands. And I think as I watch brands start to develop content across platforms and content around themselves, um, they try to appeal to everyone. And I think the point here is look for the segments of people who are going to be most loyal to your brand, and they're most loyal to your brand when they share values that your brand shares, right? So the same ethos, the same attributes, the same attitudes. So when brands start to look at themselves as personalities, like GoPro is sort of this young, adventuresome person out there doing crazy extreme sports and capturing it, a little bit of a show horse too, because why would you take a camera out when you're doing an extreme act unless you wanted to show it off to the world. So when you start to put your, a personality to the brand, people start to say, hey, you know what, I identify with that person. And you want to look for all those people that share those same values and design your experiences for them. Because it's a lot easier to design a content and brand experience or a narrative experience when you're talking to a smaller segment of people. Which leads us into one of the bigger complexities of having a multi-platform um, experience design. Which is, you've got a lot of audiences. They all have different goals, they all have different mindsets, different life stages as they enter into this experience with you and start consuming your content, which means in order to make sure that you're giving them something of value, you have to understand where they need to go, what they need, what they want at certain phases and deliver it at that time. And so by doing so, you are respecting your audience. By not doing so, you're disrespecting them and creating a bad experience. So an experience map journey, similar to Kelby's, but a little bit different too. We always start out with understanding what your story is, so that you know what attributes you're playing up, what values you want to share, what your interests are as a brand personality, so that as you start to create content to align with the people that you want to reach and try to find the commonalities in the interest base, that you actually can develop these stories from a place that you can own. Um, you want to uncover the truth, so that goes back to understanding the audience, right? Who are they? What are they? What are they consuming? What are they passionate about? How are they consuming your content? Where are they consuming your content and when? Um, you start to chart the journey. So this is where we branch off a little bit from Kelby's slides where I add another layer on in terms of life life stage and mindset. Because as we go through content consumption, we're thinking about different things. And as marketers, as we're feeding this content out to an audience that wants it, we have to understand what are the behaviors we're trying to drive. So as we go from step to step in the journey, what kind of content can I give you that will take you to the next step of what you're looking for? And when you get to that step, what's the next element after that? So I would overlay that sort of mindset of the audience and sort of um, purpose goals and behaviors that you want to drive. Um, I often see in the process of this that brands forget to tag metrics and ROI. So when it comes down to looking at the program afterwards and saying, well, was it successful? They go, oh, wait, we forgot to track you know, what was the action we were trying to drive people to take. So putting in the KPIs within that brand journey that you are um, mapping is really important because it's a good reminder for you too that everything has to lead to an ROI because in this day and age, we have no excuse for not being able to produce metrics on performance. 
Um, and then, after all of that, then you make sure that the story you want to tell, the pieces that you're going to tell it in, the components you're delivering it, match each one of those journeys, which then goes back to using your map because you're going to have multiple journeys because we're going back to the previous slide that says you're tackling niches, you're not going for a one story fits all. So one story could have many narratives and many different perspectives because we're all in different life stages, different mindsets. So this is just an example of what um, a multi-platform narrative experience could look like. Sorry, it's a little bit small, but on the right, you'll see, or the left, you'll see two boxes with photos. Those are personas. And that kind of identifies who that, that niche audience is, their likes, their dislikes, their goals. And then the, the vertical right next to that is all the different mediums. And so the ones that meet with the different personas, you're mapping content to not only at the bottom, the awareness cycle, and sort of the mind set of the, the consumer at that awareness cycle, but also the behaviors and metrics. And then as you move forward in the journey, you're changing up that content depending on where they're going to go next in terms of consumption and what they need to see to be able to take the next step with you. So this is also a slide about it's not as easy as it sounds. There's a lot of complexity and orchestration that happens in developing a cross-platform narrative. So it takes a lot of thought. And this is where data becomes really important in informing sort of the brand narrative, but also the brand journey which creates a memorable experience if done well. And last, because you have a lot of different people that you're talking to and it's a unique journey for each, the stories are going to branch. But the one thing it has to do to make it sure that you have a coherent experience and not something that feels really fragmented is it always has to roll back up to what was your narrative. So if we go back to the slide before that had the journey, it starts out with knowing what your story is so that it all rolls up and reinforces what you want to say about your brand, how you want people to feel about it, how you associate from an attributes and a value standpoint. So um, since we're talking a lot about data and forming stories, I want to pass this over to Bread and Butter and Jessie because she has some really great points to share. Thank you. So um, adding to the complexity of, of that tree and of those branches and all the different narratives you need to build as a brand adds the complexity now of we're not just dealing in the digital space with one screen. We are now dealing with multiple screens, multiple OSs, multiple sizes. Um, so layering that in on top of actually trying to, to craft a story that makes sense for that particular audience segment and then land that message where people are spending time uh, makes our job as marketers incredibly challenging. Um, I think what's really interesting about this slide um, is it's both a challenge and an opportunity. Multiple screens equals multiple touch points. And it's often been said that phones in our hands, smartphones in our hands today are kind of like the cookie for our lives. Um, we have this object with us that's telling us where we're going, what we're buying, what we're doing, um, what geo we're spending most time in and what we do in that space. Um, so how do brands actually use that information in a meaningful way to help craft that story and apply the right story to the right person at the right time. This data on this particular slide I think is quite fascinating, that different screens play a different role in our lives throughout the day. So again, looking at day parting and time parting our media and communications probably becomes one of the most important parts of what we do in, as a media planner or a, or a communications planner, as we want to try and maximise marketing budgets and minimise waste, and actually trying to find people at the device that they're using at that time with a meaningful message allows your media dollars to work that much harder for you. Um, I think uh, the other thing that uh, is incredibly important as we tell our brand stories is this concept of everything that we do or everything that someone does with our brand has an action and that action has a value even if it's not a transaction. So actually trying to understand all of those different touch points that someone has with your brand along that journey um, is incredibly valuable even if they don't necessarily transact at the end of that journey. Um, and applying value to all of those different uh, touch points touch points along the way are also uh, both challenging but with the tools and technology that we have in place today um, is becoming much more of a viable option. 
So we can start to therefore think, as we think that every action has a value, then how does it have a value across your direct media communications, as well as your sort of brand high-level awareness communications? It's much easier to tell stories when you're trying to just do an awareness campaign. It's a beautiful place to get really creative and tell really big brand messages and, and sort of throw a bunch of different paint spots out there and hope it'll stick with your audience. When you start looking at sort of the more short and fleeting, a little bit more expensive, but direct response initiatives, e.g. click here now to buy your shoes from Zappos, um, those kind of things are much, much harder. And getting super crisp on what that communication message is to Julie so she doesn't get served the same black shoe uh, commercial that, or the ad that she's been seeing for the last four days straight, but actually give her something different, um, again, is a challenge for a marketer, but again, possible today. Um, I think the other thing that um, is a responsibility of brands and marketers is this concept of creating a value exchange. You have to, of course, when you're working for a company, they're paying your salary, uh, so you have to always put them first. But at the end of the day, you're creating value not just for the business that you're working for, the business that you're in, but for the people that are buying your products. Um, and thinking every, through everything you do in a marketing communication standpoint as creating a value exchange, what is the benefit for my business and what is the benefit for our customer, both our current loyal, loyalists and potential net new prospects? Um, and then how do we craft our story to actually make sense for both sides of the equation. Um, and I think we're getting um, incredibly clever at being able to target both audience and geo and contextually relevant segments um, and split up our audiences so we can actually serve them up with messages that make sense for that person at that time. Uh, one of the clients that we're working with now is a telecommunications client have over 250 audience segments for one campaign. It's a three-month campaign, 250 segments, 250 different stories, and essentially 250 different sets of creative, which sounds incredibly overwhelming and almost ridiculous. But what's quite fascinating about that is as we start to optimise throughout a campaign period, we get super crisp and super concise in terms of what that story and messaging is. And we actually get those segments right down to one would hope less than 100 uh, with you know, half of that in terms of messaging around that. So being able to actually do that over a period of time, learn from the data that we're getting and then use that to optimise the message is key to creating that value. And then finally, um, we talk a lot about craft using content and big ideas, ideas of the currency in which we trade for sure, um, but also we can use data in a more meaningful way today than we ever have. And Julie mentioned earlier on, you know, there's all this conversation about big data and, you know, what does it really mean? We, we can measure so much today, but I think one of the biggest challenges for marketers is actually which data makes sense, which matters and what doesn't, um, and how do I get to the data that matters most in order to optimise my business or my, or my marketing communications um, and use that effectively um, in a timely fashion. So I think um, there's lots of different ways we can think about this, but the key things that we look at when we're planning uh, media communications for clients is using data for advanced targeting and attribution. Attribution is so important. We can't continue to rely on the last click. I know probably most of you don't do that anymore, but many, many brands that I speak with are still, unfortunately, tied to that last click measurement. We don't need to do that today. We can actually attribute, like I said earlier, success to other elements, other communications from social and search right through to display. We understand what's actually having an impact and driving a consumer to take that action. So let's put the right value against those components. Um, I think media and platform integration is incredibly important. Like we said earlier, there's a lot of different places we can put a brand message. So let's be really considerate as to how we do that and try again to maximise the media dollars and put it in the hands of people at a time that matters to them um, and in a place, potentially uh, in a retail store, for example, where they can actually go and transact immediately. Um, access to that data is important. Do I buy third-party data? Do I work with companies like Blue Kai to bring in that information? And what data actually does matter to my business? Or can I just use my first-party data? What is my website, my Facebook page, my Twitter profile telling me about my brand? Is that enough to inform my, my storytelling? Um, and then obviously process and organisational rigour is key. Um, I think we're getting much, much better at that um, and understanding the role that paid, owned and owned media has within an organisation and the kind of expertise that is required. Um, I think it's fascinating that the concept of a data scientist as a, as a career and a job uh, role didn't exist until the last couple of years. Likewise, the concept of social media didn't exist um, as a job role um, for, you know, five, six years ago. So, you know, 
things are changing quickly and how do we uh, stay ahead of the curve um, and process and operational rigour will help us do that. Um, and then, quite frankly, right back to what Esther was saying, is up front, thinking about the objectives is your story. What is your brand's story? What's going to have an impact to your customers and prospects? Um, and define those KPIs and measurement rationales up front. Um, you know, does a click or an impression really matter? Um, or are you actually just more interested in engagement? Whatever those metrics are, think about them up front before you go and execute a communications campaign. And the likelihood is that that campaign will stick and last longer in, in consumers' mind. Um, and I think really just to, to sort of leave off this part of um, the presentation today, um, we wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some of the innovators um, who are helping storytell and measure in this space. Um, Buddy.com is an example, a company that um, I do a lot of work with, and they're an example of someone who is thinking about measurement and metrics in a totally different way. They're using APIs to understand what's going on with inside a closed environment of an app. Um, we are are seeing a lot of brands spending a lot of money uh, on apps and building apps and everyone wants an app um, and the problem is no one's really measuring anything uh, in terms of what's going on in that app and they're incredibly viable um, brand uh, mechanisms. So why aren't we measuring that? What are we doing to help understand the impact that's having on your customers? Um, JumpTap is another example of a company innovating in this space, um, allowing us now to do uh, cross-platform, cross-OS mobile ad attribution. So we can and finally start to see how people are clicking from their iPad to their, uh, to their smartphone device um, and what that's telling an advertiser at the end of the day. So um, this is pretty fascinating and, um, and interesting uh, in terms of how technology is driving changes in how we buy mobile media. Mobile Dev HQ, App Store SEO. How do you get your app up to the top of the tree in the iTunes app store? It's incredibly difficult to do. There's now technology available to help you do that. It's not just about sending it out to your family and friends and hoping they click on it and, and share it. Um, Inside Social, they're moving social media measurement. Um, a new company here in Seattle, they just presented at Techstars this past week. Um, they're actually trying to think about social media measurement in a slightly different way. They're moving away just from sentiment and looking at text on a page and reviews and ratings. And they're actually trying to really quantify what an action is taking when someone looks at that Yelp review and then goes and acts on it. Um, they're doing really interesting things in, in terms of measuring social. And then you've got Session M. It's, you know, it's basically a reward awards based uh, app game mechanism. So it rewards you for interaction with a brand. Um, and they've built incredible technology that scales beautifully across all the apps that we like to um, engage with. So, um, and then there's of course Zaxxis, which is our, you know, one of our biggest uh, data exchanges here and, and data management platforms here in the US that I'm sure many of you have had experience with. So, all these innovators are providing us with the tools um, and, and technology to tell, not only tell stories better, but to actually measure the success of those stories. Um, and I think that's a pretty exciting place to be. Great. So we've got another half an hour together to now get into the fun Q&A part. And hopefully from the short presentations you've realized we've got a great group of panelists up here that are all saying the same thing, but definitely with a distinctive twist. So I'm hoping we can play that out a little bit here today um, and make it a little bit more exciting. So uh, clearly just kind of jump off what Jessica, you were saying on around innovation, around measurement and the technologies that exist out there. And personally being in this business, you know, I'm very aware of how I'm being marketed to and what's happening and why. And I don't feel like companies are doing it right. And maybe that's because I know what they can do. So I feel like they're missing the mark. But then again, maybe they are, and they're just not providing that right value to me. So the question for all three of you is, a lot of companies like to talk about that, you know, they're using big data and they know how to use big data, saying they've got their measurement, you know, systems in place and all that. They know who their customers are and where to find them. Do you guys believe it? And what, you know, for the companies that are doing it right, why are they doing it right versus ones that might not be? All right, I'll take that one. Um, so yeah, look, I think I think a lot of the bigger companies have um, 
have access and, and quite frankly, the budgets to go and test and trial and explore. Um, I think there's a lot of times where, like, you've got to go test, build a testing matrix, you know, go, go test and trial these different things, but it costs money to do that. Um, so I think it's really hard for small and medium-sized businesses to go out and spend time and money, you know, building relationships with all of these different companies. Um, so I definitely think enterprise-level businesses are, are doing a hell of a lot um, of exploration in this space and are finding ways to identify exactly who's engaging, who's showing intent, at what time, um, and then serving them up with, with information that makes sense to them at that moment. Um, it's not an exact science um, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but I know for a fact that, um, that they're getting better and better at doing it and that, quite frankly, companies like Zaxxis as a, as a DMP um, is, you know, making other parts of our industry somewhat redundant right now um, because they're essentially taking on the role of, of networks and those kind of companies um, and, and absorbing it and rolling it all up into one big data management platform. So um, we're not sure if bigger is better yet, but essentially, yes, that's the, that's the way that we're seeing things roll out. Um, I have to say that um, I want to say it's half and half. I think they're starting to get the right data and they're starting to look at the data, but I think there are two challenges. One, I don't think companies are entirely clear about the questions they want to ask because the data is only as good as the questions that you put forth, right? Um, two, once they get that slew of data, I think there's an interpretation that happens between the numbers and what comes out as insights, which then become tactical implementations for programs that you want to apply it to. Um, that includes the journeys and the narratives that you want to write. Um, so I think there's a gap there that they might see the data, but it's a science to really try to interpret the story, extract the narrative out of the data itself. Um, so I think there's a lot of learning still to be done there. Um, our company's doing it right. I think, again, to Jess's point, depends on the, big, the scale of the company and also the priorities in terms of where they're putting funding because it does take a lot of man hours and it does take a lot of money to actually build those data models and to actually take time and build personas. So, for example, it's not a slide I provided today, but you know, in developing a journey, we do some very complex personas that just don't look at a typical persona, but then it overlays all of the hear, think, feel, see, you do, because these are all the external elements that influence what your experience will be, and therefore the content that you are going to be receiving along that journey, and therefore the content that might actually um, compel you to take an action, right? And that's the measurable part that the companies need to see at the end of the day. It's how many people took that action and what does that action mean to me? So when you start to ask some of the more complex questions around data, I think that's where it gets a little bit slippery mm -hmm. and you have to really understand from your own perspective, your company perspective, what's my brand, what's my objective? For this particular niche audience, what am I trying to move? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do think that, I mean, it comes down to using data to deliver personalized experiences. You know, how do you create something memorable? I mean, that's kind of what we've been saying. But, and if you think about what it takes to do that, how long did it take for people to figure out that we needed a social CRM system? What was the arc there? Started in what, 2007, 2008? And now we've got some really humming uh, social CRM systems, Adobe. Uh, Salesforce, they've been buying these people up um, and these systems up to actually help drive this personalization, tap into this data, kind of to make the experience that they want to deliver around you. Um, and whether it's 250 telecom re relevant type of folks that Jess is working on or just 10, you know, that notion of experience is, is really critical. And I think brands, to, to Esther and, and Jess's point, it, it's, it is mixed, but then you layer on the complexities of mobile. I mean, we haven't even started really to, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of folks here that have started on it, I just don't know you. But um, <laughs> lot, they haven't really started to scratch the surface of that mobile CRM. What, how does that really gonna play into the, what we learned from the social um, uh, world that we, we just kind of are now starting to grok? And so I, I think there's a lot of still testing and trialing and, and lifelong learners um, of figuring out how to actually do this right and deliver those personalized experiences through using big data. But I think. To to, to Esther's point, I mean, if you think about upstream and downstream kind of things you need to do to kick something off, it starts with data. It starts with uh, understanding the conversation analysis, the influencer analysis, whatever that is, whatever your angle is, and then you build the playbooks, and then the downstream stuff like apps and creative and sites, all that stuff come into play into that to make the playbook real. So I think that's kind of a structure that a lot of people are really just starting to embrace. 
Well, and I just um, on that point as well, we just worked with Zaxxas, uh, which is a data management platform, um, on a client. And actually what was really interesting about this particular engagement was we spent, the client sort of said to us, we just, we just want to do, um, you know, a ton of direct response media. We're actually not interested in doing any kind of awareness. And we're like, well, actually, we think you should invest in some awareness, big brand sort of tactics. Because what we're going to do is actually by pr building your private data management platform, a private network, we're going to use your first party data to sort of fill the cookie pools and fill the information sort of as we push people through the funnel into the middle and lower parts of that marketing funnel, which we all like to talk about. But all the data that we got from that sort of awareness campaign actually drove our direct response budget um, and made those dollars work incredibly hard for us. So interestingly enough, it was the data that we captured doing the big brand stuff that ended up actually dictating how we played out the direct response. And because they had a private data management network and they were able to access that data uh, on the fly, um, it allowed them to make really swift decisions um, and, and, you know, ultimately it was an incredibly successful campaign. So that's another way that you can see how those sort of the top and bottom of the funnel essentially can work together to help inform all of your communication strategy. Great. I mean, obviously there's probably some clients in the audience today, people at work, you know, for agencies, service providers, whatnot. Um, I think one thing definitely that I hear here, I mean, we've all worked with clients, and I can say for some of our clients, some have got it right, some don't, some might just have one little group that's got it right. Some, some days I feel like it's the small, medium companies that might not have money to do it, right. but they can start early enough to implement the right, right. systems yes. to do it right versus the big on, the enterprise companies that are like, oh my God, we've got this bohemoth amount of data and nothing's connected and we don't know who we're talking to and we're all talking to the same person. So one thing though I'm hearing you know, loud and clear is that there is no silver bullet, right? I mean, this is a this is a hard challenge, and especially when a, you know clients might be working with disparate agencies as well and getting kind of different parts of that journey and life cycle from different people. Again, adding more to that fragmentation beyond devices and everything else that we've kind of hinted on. Um, are we asking the impossible of marketers today around this? And, you know, Jessica, you had mentioned that telecommunications company, you know, and I'm actually surprised to hear you say that they actually have 250 segments and 250, you know, different creative versions and all of that, where back in the day, and I'm not that old, I promise, um, you know, we did do that, right? Where it was all about segmentation and you did go deep. With, you know, but now when there's so much out there, there's, you know, there's so many different, you know, um, so, there's social media, there's, you know, the World Wide Web and search back in the time when that didn't exist and all this kind of clutter in the market space or place. Um, so what do you guys think about that? Are we asking the impossible or do you think that this is an achievable thing? <laughs> I'll take a stab at it and I'd love to hear some of you guys thought afterwards as well. But I mean, if you think about what Buddy's doing, what DataZoo has done, what Inside Social is doing, some of these innovators, they're trying to push the envelope here and actually get us to this state of helping brands through these tools to actually tap into these insights. And for instance, like DataZoo, I can know based on your click to a site, I can, you, you're an iOS developer in Montana and you like games. So the next time you come, I'm going to, when you visit my portal, I'm going to serve you a game, uh, iOS game video and see where it goes from there. Now with Buddy, you can now extend that kind of same level of personalization into the mobile sphere. So now whenever you're surfing around your apps, you know, your, or the mobile web, you can actually figure out where, how to personalize the experience there. Inside Social, for instance, they actually can track, and there's a variety of other companies, just since Jess mentioned them, I'll mention them. They're, they're, they're actually tracking influencer down to a specific KPI. So I know Esther drives a bunch of uh, email newsletter signups, and Julie drives a bunch of video views. So uh, if she's driving a bunch of video views that are selling jeans, you can bet your butt in, in five years' time, or five months' time, when she sold 20 pairs of jeans, I'm going to send her a pair of jeans. So it's that level of personalization that I think, going back to the notion of trial and error and experimenting, I think you have to do that. And I, it is really, really hard work, but for everybody in this room, we may not have the biggest budgets to go work with a buddy or a data zoo or whoever, but you know, figuring out, surfacing these things to the brands we represent, to the clients we represent, and actually helping them understand what's out there to get there, that's kind of part of our job. So asking marketers is not impossible because there's tools out there to do it. It's just about how do you package them. Yeah, I, th I think I'd like to add another level of dimension here. I don't think it's impossible what we're asking for. I agree with Kelby that it is 
Uh, it requires a lot of hard work. There's, again, no easy quick hit button to do that. It takes a lot of manual aggregation of data points. Um, I think what hinders this process or slows it down and, and is going to make this a very long-term sort of change um, is internal infrastructure that happen within brands. And I think we all know this, brand side, agency side, the siloing that happens inside of all the organizations. So when we think about narratives and journeys and behaviors, you know, the, it doesn't start in one place and stay in one little ecosystem. It travels across the entire eco ecosystem. So it could be social, it could be paid media, it could be earned media, it could be owned. And so all of those parts and even segments within those parts are owned by different people inside the organization. And I think it's really training people to think about sharing that data because it all gets locked into its own silo because people aren't thinking about, hey, this user is going to travel through this territory, which is mine, but it's going to be influenced by social, which is someone else's, right? And when we start to learn that it's all the same ecosystem, we're all playing with the same people, we need to know what their behaviors are at each phase because it's different, I think we'll start to crack this. But until that time, when you're only getting a slice of the picture, it's really hard to build a complete journey that's meaningful to someone because you only can see from point A to B, not point A to Z. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. You know, and I, I'm going to tell a little personal side story here. This is kind of, I think, in the, the thread. I'm sure everyone in the, this audience um, is thinking about a brand or right now that they, you know you're being pitched for. So I love American Express. Um, I use my card, try to get my points, get my free, you know, trips to wherever I need to go. And they so badly want me to become a platinum, platinum card member. And I know it. Like, it's now become a game, right? Because I get, I get the, you know, the direct mail packages. I'm getting the email. But to Esther's point, they're not engaging me in any other channel, right? And the reason I'm not flipping the switch, because it's a lot of money that I have to pay to, like, have the platinum card. And I'm not really sure I'm going to get value out of all of those interactions, right? But it's, it's really bugging me, and I can't believe I'm actually thinking about this. I do have a more complex life than this, but it's really <laughs> bugging me that, that they're, you know, that they're not, you know, like, I probably would be a great candidate given the amount of travel I have and the fact that I have kids and would love to go to the lounge so I don't have to, like, you know, run around the airport or whatever that might be, but they're just missing that next little step, you know, where they could just, A, engage me in other channels, find out a little bit more about me, maybe give me a pop-up survey, say, what would it take, whatever it might be, right? And personally, I know what it would take. It would take them to show me what I actually do in my transactions today to show how I'm already going to pay for itself, how it's going to pay for itself. But, you know, I'll, I'll call them up tomorrow. Or maybe it's actually also more about <laughs> influencing your network. So you're not budging. You're not moving. Exactly. Because you're not happy with how they're speaking to you. Exactly. So you're playing a game with them. And wouldn't it be interesting if the three of us all told you today that you should totally do that. We just did that. Right. We just upgraded. Yep. You would then potentially go and do that. Bingo. So maybe the dollars are better spent tapping into your network in some way, shape or form. And you know, and trying to help drive you to make an action based on what your peers are doing. Are doing, yeah. I'll let so, you know next year yeah. whether or not I, I did it. All right, so we all know the show, and by the way, if anyone wants to come up and ask a question, please go ahead and I'll let you do the next question. Um, but we all know the showbiz world is a lot different than the world we live in, but does it really take over-the-top antics like a controversial display at the VMAs to get people's attention today? So what happened to the gray area? I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, no, I don't think it takes over the top antics. I think we've been trained to think things like the Ganem style videos and, you know, when Coca-Cola had the, the Mentos thing, um, you know, even the Old Spice campaigns. All great, by the way, all very entertaining, but notice they took a spike and they kind of fell after a bit of time. I think we miss the point sometimes in wanting to be, again, aspiring to be that brand that you want to think is hip and cool. And I think the point is, when we go online and we consume content, we're kind of looking for something. We may not know it consciously. It might be a subconscious thing. But we have to go back to the basics and trying to understand what is it that you're online for? What are you looking to consume? What really interests you? And be able to address that as an answer to a question. Right? It's really interesting because I've been doing a lot of work with YouTube lately and YouTube is the third largest search engine online. Right, So people actually go in there and, and type, how do I tie a tie, do um, a Hunger Games type makeup from you know Capital Couture. And I think if people were thinking about the way people search and what they're looking for online, the answer, the content is the answer to that question. Okay, well, here's how you put on makeup. There's a girl in Australia, I can't remember her name, she's a YouTube fan, um, celebrity, but she answers this question. 
Who is it? No, I was thinking New Zealand board. Sorry. Ah, sorry. But uh, anyway, she answers this question with a series of videos, and God love her, she gets hundreds of thousands of views every single video because she answers the simple question, how do I do the makeup that gives you the smoky eyes? And it's a visual, right? And so in many ways, it's so much easier to use video as a way to answer this question because it doesn't consume a lot of time. It's a very quick thing. I can watch it. I can, you know, mimic it. With reading, it's a little tougher. It's a little more effort. So I think it's really about giving people what they want and not trying so hard to be the thing you aspire to be, you know, unless you actually have it, like GoPro, right? I think they do a really good job of that because they're all about extreme sports and the camera becomes sort of the enabler and also the spotlight. And they enlist the community to go out and do this in your life. I enable you to do it. Now go out and shoot and share it with people. So that could be kind of exciting. Yeah. Who has seen uh, the Friday song, Rebecca Black? <laughs> a little raise of hands. Now what about Chinese food? Yes, same producer. So it's, I mean, I, I don't think the gray is dead by any means, but the gray is boring. It's not sexy. The man on the horse was sexy some regards to some people. Um, the Chinese food, Chinese food is not a good song by any means whatsoever, but it's very shareable. It's very viral. I watched it, and I'm not bragging at all, last Thursday, and I had 150, 158K views, 158,000 views. And you go on there today, it's got over 11 million views because it's just some stupid song. But that, that gray in the area that we're talking about, finding out how to do makeup and stuff for our own personal interests, that's not really sexy, but Man on a Horse Spike, it helped launch a, a, a new way of thinking about Old Spice. Now they got what's Wes Welker coming out of the locker room missing half the game. Interesting. So they're, they're kind of, they've created a platform, a story that people come to expect. So those, those antics, over-the-top antics, are kind of launching pads uh, at times to help brands kind of do something different, help them get out of that gray, so to speak. So I don't think the gray is dead. The gray is just boring. If it aligns with the brand. If it doesn't, right. then it feels completely dissonant, and I feel like they're trying too hard, and you've lost me. You've created more brand damage by trying, ooh, it's like brain damage, but brand damage, um, by trying to impress me with something that you're not. That's like meeting someone and saying, hey, let's talk all about me, and by the way, I'm saying I'm doing all this stuff, but I don't really have any chops to back it up. But I guess, uh, you know, what you guys are talking about as well is this concept um, that we were talking about earlier, this concept of lighting fires. So sometimes you have to light a fire in order to develop that brand equity. You have to spend money, get people talking about your brand, do something flashy, do something different, um, and then hope that over time the mission shifts to, um, you know, keeping that fire lit, you know, and, and just kind of using other methods to help drive that conversation. And there's a, um, I'm sure many of you in this room um, know a management guru, a guy by the name of uh, Peter Drucker. He talked a lot about this concept um, of a business's reason for being is to create customers. And I think... Um, what this ties back into is kind of the, the new version of that is, you know, creating customers who create customers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where businesses have shifted to today. Um, and I think by giving people content or stories or big flashy something something, whatever it might be, allows people to have something to talk about, have that social object to have a discussion about and then um, use that to help hopefully drive further conversation about that brand. Right. So, um, yeah, so, you know, as, as we mentioned, you know, the VMAs, obviously that was a big stint to potentially, you know, reboot someone or, or not. But um, what does it truly take to get the attention of the attention deprived? So how would you counsel the audience to think about the evolution of value across channels, devices, and platforms when you can't be a Miley and have that platform, literally, right? But, um, you know, what does it take to get the attention of the attention deprived, given everything that's going on out there when you're just a regular marketer or brand? And well, my question is, did you derive any value from Miley? Anybody? <laughs> no, but we're still talking about it. Right, we're still and that's about actually it. pretty phenomenal. Right, right or wrong, whatever you thought about it. Um, <laughs> she, she's a social powerhouse. I mean, we're still talking about, and we're not talking about Robin Thicke, we're talking about Miley, which is even more interesting. Good point. But that's a whole different... Yeah. So you could hijack, I guess that's, that's one the strategy. That's session. Yeah. <laughs> Hijack the conversation, just like she has with Pop. <laughs> um, so the question again was? Um, how does, <laughs> see what Miley did, see what sorry. she did? <laughs> what does it truly take to get the attention of the attention deprived when we've got, you know, you know the evolution of channels with de and devices and platforms and really continue to drive that right. value? But to, for what it's worth, my really only answer to that is you talk to them about what matters to them. Exactly. End of story. So 
data mine, find out what's important to them, find out what their intent has been, what they're searching for, what they want. Zappos, I'm sorry to actually call the name of the company, but the company that you bought the shoes from, um, you know, they didn't look hard enough as to what mattered to you. You've already bought black shoes. Mm. You, you have maybe shown intent to do something else by a different colour pair of shoes. Like, find out what it was that you want and give you that, give you that piece of content. Mm -hmm. it's, Pretty simple. Yeah, that, I would agree with that. And just try to understand the emotional mindset that that audience is in when they're in that particular spot. Timing has a lot to do with everything, right? So um, I do a lot of work with travel companies, and a lot of the work focuses around um, taking people through a purchase path to consider you know, a, a cruise or, you know, a vacation somewhere. And there's a lot of emotions that go with that journey, as, as along with a lot of fantasy, right? Because you're imagining that whole escapism thing. Um, it's understanding where they are at the different spots. Like, in awareness, you know, it's about getting them and getting them to dream big about what's possible. And as they start to really consider, like, ooh, this is a possibility. I can actually afford this trip. Then it's validation. Mm -hmm. Okay, wait, can I afford this trip? Is it really as good as what it's going to cost? Am I going to get what I want out of it? So that means I'm going to start asking my friends, and I'm going to be checking all the peer-to-peer -peer because I want to know from someone who took the trip, right? I need validation. Mm -hmm. Validation then leads to research. So then you need to talk to someone who's an expert so that you feel like you've done your due diligence. So if you start to break things down in those types of steps and understand not only what my, my purpose is, but also where, what is my mindset? What am I insecure about? What do I need to feel comfortable to take the next step? That's, I think, how you drive value. Because if you're meeting those and anticipating those needs, to me, that's the ultimate experience you could give someone. It's the highest level of concierge service. Great. Uh, and actually, this next question is probably more directed to you as well, Esther, when you said the emotional mindset. Um, so what do you feel is the biggest challenge facing brands when trying to land a story with a specific target audience, say Gen X versus Gen Y? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's, you know, when you think of generations beyond just, let's say, students and business decision makers, you know, a lot of marketers struggle. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you, you know, what do you feel is the biggest challenge facing brands when trying to land a story with them? Well, I, I think it comes back to authenticity um, and, and being able to be yourself. So going back to that one little slide with the, the post-it note that says, be true to yourself and you'll ring true to others. I think a lot of brands, and right now millennials are a huge category, right? Everybody wants that 18 to 25 year old and how do we reach them? They're the next generation of buyers. But I think a lot of brands try to overdo it and, and try to talk to them in their way instead of just understanding that there are certain things that that audience you know, grooves to that are important. Experience is important to them. They're less consumer oriented. Um, you know, social good is important to them. The, the things that a company does on a, a social or eco level impacts the decision in terms of whether they're going to buy or engage with a brand. They need to know that the brand has purpose beyond just themselves and making money. So I think if you can tap into that mindset and then kind of look back on your own brand and say, okay, what about that mindset might align with what my brand believes in, my ethos, my values, right? Which is essentially my value prop, right? Mm -hmm. um, then create stories that talk to them in that way. That rings true and authentic because being divas means that we have a high bullshit meter. Mm -hmm. And we yep. can sense it when you're trying to sell us something that's not true. So I think that's the biggest challenge. It's, it's bridging um, the reality and growing because you've got to start somewhere. But like starting a story that has a strong base to be authentic and building actions towards it. So taking steps that support it over time so that as you look back, you can go, yeah, that's authentic Starbucks, right? Mm -hmm. That whole government action, you could say, well, that was a stint, but to me it felt very authentic because they've taken similar roles with the, the, the actions they've, they've done with the brand over time. Yeah. So I think that's the big one, bridging reality with aspiration. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. I mean, if you think about how to get your brand to be remarkable, mm -hmm. getting people to remark and talk about it, yeah. it's all about believability. If you if you if they don't believe you, then it's just you're you're dead in the water. So I think that that relevancy, while relevancy and value are kind of tied at the hip, uh, you know, having a believable brand and this notion, who uses talkability? I mean, that's, <laughs> I, I, does. that's one of my worst. <laughs> really, it's, my brand is talkable, but remarkable maybe. Um, but figuring out how you can actually make people believe and uh, understand. And, you know what you're really trying to sell and, and like Esther said you know f figuring out those nuggets whether it's a stretch you know two stretches may work but four or five definitely are not going to work so just keep that in mind when you're building the, the strategies and tactics great um, so I think we've got somebody who wants to share a question which is great because we've got four minutes left so thank you for coming up uh, you're talking a lot about the overarching strategy and brand awareness where do you see real-time content marketing coming into play how do you define real-time content uh, 
a conver like engaging with consumers via Twitter and the conversation that's going on. So say they're seeing a commercial and say you want to sell them that product and then they start talking about it. Where do you see uh, the conversation going and how brands are engaging with people on Twitter and on Facebook? Do you know what's really interesting about that is that um, a couple of the brands I'm working with right now are using the content that's coming in on Twitter to actually inform their digital direct response media buy. So they're actually taking that data and using that to decide what text, what creative, what, what message is actually going to be in the content that they then put in traditional digital um, you know, format. Um, so there's, there's that opportunity. But I, to me, the, the sort of answer to your question is it comes down to that operational rigour and organisational structure. You need people in an organisation who are going to be managing those platforms, you know, as in real time as possible and using that information to then figure out where to go to either to respond or go plant that seed on other platforms within your owned media suite. So um, having bodies on the ground that can do that is expensive but necessary if you're willing to invest in that kind of real time communication and one to one uh, communication. I mean, like Dell's, uh, I think Dell is kind of a, a, an example that did this years ago. They created the command center Gatorade as well, Nike. So that, that notion, that infrastructure is critical to be able to do what Ty just did with the Halloween thing, the Vine thing. If you haven't looked at it, check it out. It's pretty interesting. Um, and like Julie was saying, Oreo in the Super Bowl. I mean, being able to have those people that are constantly listening to be able to see something that is proud to jump the shark before it does, that's the only way you can do it. So it's people, people and bandwidth, I think. And we're actually even doing it with Microsoft, where based on the social conversations that are happening, having kind of 24-7 creative people there to respond back mm -hmm. in visual ways. But again, it is time, it is money, and you know. And, and we're seeing it in entertainment, which is a, an area that I work a lot in too, where during a second screen experience, you're monitoring the conversations that are happening. Um, if the storytellers and the networks are more adventuresome, a little less risk adverse, they tend to want to be able to write in some of those aspects for future. So they leave room or unanswered areas in the story to be able to write in sort of what's being trending you know, or, or talked about during the show. Do you see more and more brands shifting to that as yes. engagement marketing? That's part of what I would call optimizing the user journey or the content strategy. Yeah. Well, and then you see like Facebook and Twitter, they're battling out who owns the eyeballs when people are watching TV. How do you serve right. an ad? How do you get people to talk about it and spread it even more? So yeah, I think it's, it's just like a lot of things like mobile CRM. We haven't really even scratched the surface there. Thanks. Thank you. Any other one last question before we wrap it up? No? Okay. Okay. Last question because we literally are at time is people here came to talk about, you know, to hear us talk about we're all divas now, how to reach high maintenance consumers with your brand story. What's your quick one bit word of wisdom you want to leave everyone with before they walk out of here? You're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. There you go. I know, done. Esther? Right. <laughs> um, no, do you know what? If it's one word, it's intent. It's intent. And it's such a traditional digital media word, so I'm sorry to throw it back at you. But find intent. Find people who are raising their hand to get excited about something. It's easy to do with entertainment and creative brands. You've got great content. It's really hard to do with B2B brands and brands that maybe people don't want to talk with their friends about. So find those who are showing intent across digital or traditional uh, channels and serve them up what they're looking for. Don't always just think about what you're trying to get from it. Well, since I'm the, the storyteller on the stage, I'm going to say audience, really understand what drives them, what they need to see along the journey, because you can feed them really good content, but if they're not in the right mindset to consume it, it's not going to activate them to do anything. I, a derivative of Esther's is listen. Listen to, use the Radiant 6, use Visible, use whatever you're using. Listen to the conversation, figure out who the big tastemakers are, who the trendsetters are, what they like, where they're operating. It informs your content and your channel strategy. And with that, you can win. Awesome. Thank you all for attending. Thank and you. go enjoy your lunch. <laughs>